This is the King's Court on Arena Sportsnet, presented by American Grappler. I got more swagger than Mick Jagger, more sex appeal than Vince Neil. All guests from all walks of life share their time with the King of Connecticut. They are dreaming of just one night, just one night with a man such as myself. Any and everything goes. I am the king of Connecticut. I was raised with class and sophistication. And now, from Norwalk, Connecticut, weighing in at 230 pounds, if George Clooney had muscles, they'd call him the king of Connecticut. The one, the only, Matt Grant. She brought me this, this big old Great Dane in this lab, and this dog has, let me just say, the Red Rocket has been out in full force, and this dog has been just fucking the ever-living, ever-living hell out of this poor lab, so much so that I felt bad I had to start separating them. And my dog is like, what the hell? You know, I mean, it's been, it's been brown chicken, brown cow over here at the King's Castle, man. Been like a 19, uh, 1980s porno. And speaking of that, we're going to get an episode going with my good friend Laura Amberlynn Bach, and we're going to talk about the business of the business of adult entertainment. Something you won't get anywhere else. That'll be an upcoming episode. But speaking of that, and speaking of kind of combating the pussification of America, uh, you know, this, um, this Trump hate week. And, uh, you know, I heard about this thing, and we had the damn hurricane here, so I didn't get a chance to hear it. We lost power. We lost power for about a day and a half. And when I finally heard this thing, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, really? This is news? This is just guys talking. And I loved it when I saw Scott Bale on Judge Jimmy Pirro's show. And, um, whatever the hell her name is, Judge Janine, I don't think it's Janine Pirro, I think it's Janine Pirro, uh, when he was on her show, and he said, this is how guys talk. And this is, ladies, how guys talk. And I know most of you already know that. Most of you already know that. But Trump, Trump was just talking about grabbing a hold of some pussy. And let me ask a question. If the American women, and this is what I saw on one of those memes, or memes, whatever the hell you call them, if the American women are so offended by that, then why the hell did Fifty Shades of Grey sell over 80 million copies? I mean, come on. So, uh, Scott Bale was on there, Chachi, Charles, he was taking charge, and very good, I agree with, I agree with what he said, but I think there's something else going on that nobody gets. I mean, this, this media and this crucified gotcha media, they don't even get it. They were so shocked to see Trump beat all these establishment politician Republicans in the primary. And I think they're in for a greater shock. 
Because this tape is going to do something that they don't get. It's going to endear. And the word is endear. If you don't know what endear means, if you're listening to this show, look it up. This is going to endear Trump to more voters. Because it's going to make him more likable. It's going to make people realize that he's more like you and I. He doesn't have to walk on eggshells like these pussies in the media and like these career politicians that have never earned a real dime in their lives. He is more of a real person. And it's going to be a shock. It's really going to be a shock to people. And then I see, you know, here's the other thing, kind of the backside to this. And this is probably going to upset some people, but I love upsetting people. I'm a heel. I love pissing people off. If you haven't gotten that from this show, you need to listen to it more. While Donald Trump is, is having a little guy talk with uh, the coasts of uh, whatever the hell, Access Hollywood or whatever show that is, he's having some guy talk, talking about getting some pussy, grabbing some pussy. Hillary Clinton is covering up the assaults of her husband been going on for nearly a quarter century. She's covering up the assault. She's calling these women bimbos, etc. All the Clintons care about is power. They want power, but they have no power. And they're going to learn what true power is. And that power is the power of the American people. Because we're sick of it. We're sick and tired of it. And at the top of the hour... I am going to be joined by Brady Nimmons. He's a Richland County Sheriff and a good friend of mine. He's also NOVA in WCW at the height of the Panitude era in the world of professional wrestling. So hopefully you were entertained by this first little segment. We're just getting started. We'll see you at the top of the hour. After this word from our new sponsor, Cleaver Supplements. Today's program is brought to you by Cleaver Supplements, the official presenting sponsor of Arena Sports Net. Our team is excited to provide you with an impeccable online shopping experience and remains available to assist at any time. We have natural supplements such as our Super Fat Burner, our Carnitine Stack, the famous Swole Serum for your workouts, and much more. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, do not hesitate to contact us via telephone or email, and one of our experienced team members will get back to you. Cleaver Supplements. Pure supplements for when genetics are just not enough. I am joined by a very special guest, uh, a gentleman that I met at the gym down here, and also from Mark Mills' gym here, Columbia Martial Arts. He's also attended some of the Dan Severn clinics that we do. He is currently in the Richland County Sheriff's Department, but... In a former life, back in the 90s, he was in WCW, which you all know uh, from TBS. And he was really there during the height of WCW. And he's got some cool stories about guys like Goldberg. I want to I want to welcome Brady Nimitz to the show. He was in WCW as Nova. How you doing tonight, Brady? Doing good. Thanks for calling, man. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the King's Court. So uh, we're, we're going to do a, a brief segment here, and I wanted to first start out by asking you, how did you get involved in the wild and wacky world of professional wrestling? Well, you know, I've been kind of obsessed with all things sports since, uh, like, kindergarten, um, you know, boxing, football, pro wrestling, you know, I was always in the gym, I was doing martial arts and, uh, you know, working out was what I loved to do in my college career. It was coming to a close and before I got a, I guess you'd say a quote unquote real job, something I wanted to, you know, give a try. I wanted to play pro football, but that didn't work out. I was undersized to be a college defensive lineman, so I decided to, Take a shot, go down to the WCW power plant. Del Wills kind of pushed me in that direction, and that's where it started. Cool. Yeah, Del's been a, a guest on our show, which was which was a great episode. Uh, so, what year was that that you 
I got into the WCW. And, and how did you how did you get into WCW? You, you start out in the independence or did you go right to the power plant? We went to the power plant. I uh, scheduled a tryout. My tryout was the week of August the 1st of 96. I remember my tryout, I believe 12 or 13 started. And I think three of us finished it. And uh, basically at that time, if you could just finish it and not quit, you'd get an invite to come back. And I, I finished it. I, I think I looked pretty terrible by the end of it, but they invited me back. Let's talk about that because Jim Sonnen on his show, he talks about when he tried out for the power plant and, you know, at that time he was, he was wrestling in college and he actually went during his, toward the end of his college tenure because he wanted to go in WCW and he talked about it being the hardest thing he's ever gone through. Was the Sarge running the program then at, at the power plant and tell us what that, that, that tryout consisted of. Yeah, Sarge was running it. Um, he'd start out doing squats and push-ups, and you'd think he would never end. Uh, he didn't go 10, 15 minutes in it before he'd start seeing some people drop out. I remember the first, one of the first people dropped out was a Southern Cal football player. And, uh, it was just a bad experience. Um, we did, uh, some amateur wrestling. We did a bunch of brave falls and some, some people knew how to do a little bit or not at all. And it was a three day ordeal. And, you know, and I was so sore by the end of it that for several days afterwards, when I was laying on a couch, if I wanted to move my legs, I would grab my legs with my hands to move them. Wow. And you can you said, so describe the days, like in day one, how many started and how many guys actually even made it to the end of day one? We started with, I believe, 13 that day. Uh, there were four, four that showed up for the second day. And uh, we had one guy drop out that day. The other three of us remained on. The third day wasn't really that bad. It was, it was pretty much a half day. And and by the end of it, you know, three of us were left. And they called us in one by one. Uh, they told me immediately, said, we, we don't believe you have any star potential. You're not particularly huge, um, but you are tall. You can fill out some. Um, you made it through. And uh, if you really want to come back and do this, we'll do everything we can for you. And, and they did. And you're, you're a big guy, a, a big athletic guy. You're still in great shape. What was your height and weight at that time? Uh, 6'4". And at the trial, I was probably only about 220 pounds because Bill Wilson really prepared me for what I was going to have to do there. And uh, Scott Vick, who became sick boy, him and Craig Phillips went a month before me, and they reiterated how hard it was. And I had a whole summer to train for it. I was doing a ton of cardio, and I lost about 15, 20 pounds just to get in the cardiovascular condition, I thought, to make it through. Yeah, and you, and you did make it through, and from there, I know I've seen a match with you where you were in a tag team with Gangrel, it was actually before he became WWE Superstore Gangrel, and I think it was about the week before, it was your tag team partner on WTVS and WCW, and you had a match against Ming and the Barbarian, I saw, I saw that match, and how far along was that in your career, and, and who was your first opponent? when you were on uh, WCW TV, because you went right into TV, didn't you? I'd only done one independent show um, before that. I'd actually, earlier the Cat Miller broke my arm in training, which ended up being a huge gift, actually, because by that time, my body weight had dropped down to about 210 pounds. And they were pretty clear they did not want to put me on TV being that skinny. Uh, when he broke my arm, that had me out for four months, so I was able to, I came back home so I could eat all I wanted, train every day, and I came back about 230, 235 pounds, and they took me down to the next Orlando trip. The very first match I actually did was, but with, uh, tag team match Brad Chaney, this was before he was Lodi, and we were Hector Garza and Liz Mark Jr. 
Okay, awesome. Now, when you say that Ernest the Cat Miller broke your arm, did, was, did he shoot on you to break your arm, or was it just an accident? It was an accident. We were, we were going over a drill over and over, and everybody kept y'all, y'all doing harder and harder. I was throwing it. You know, I got a martial arts background, obviously, what he does. We were doing something where I was throwing a spinning back fist. He was stepping into a knife hand block, and we were just going as hard as we could, and he hit the, uh, my forearm, it uh, just kind of snapped. I didn't even realize it snapped then because there was just so much pain in that place. That wasn't really anything out of ordinary, but uh, yeah. A couple of days later, it didn't get any better, and I went to the doctor, and they took an x-ray, and I could tell, I mean, look at the x-ray myself, yep, that's broke. Damn, now, uh, so you came back, you had that match, you have a very entertaining story about Goldberg, and you had a kind of a take on the old quote-unquote, who's next? You have a different, you have a different uh, take on that from when you were training with Goldberg, explain that, because that's pretty funny. Right, Goldberg's a great guy, but, you know, when he came in, he just jumped right into the training, and, uh, I mean, it's, it's very cardiovascular. Most of the guys, they're really, really big guys, and, uh, it's a little bit different for him. I remember Goldberg, we were doing all these drills, we went through our morning routine of squats and all that, and, and I remember he was standing next to me, hung over the ropes, and he looked over at me and said, what's next? <laughs> and I thought, uh, now we're going outside to run and uh, some sprints. I mean, check it out. I ain't running any sprints. But he did. He was a, I mean, he was a real great athlete, tough guy. And he excelled really quick. Yeah, he, he was game for it. And obviously, you know, he didn't get weeded out. Uh, he, he had a, a great career. So talk about some of the other guys that you wrestled. What are some memorable matches you had? There in WCW. Well, one of them was Sarge himself. Um, he liked to beat me to death in that match, but it was a good match. I felt great after it was over. He, I remember him taking me outside on the floor, slamming me and dropping elbows on me and outside the ring. But uh, it didn't really hurt me. It did the next day, but uh, it just went great. Everything, everything worked good. He was real happy with it. Jody Hamilton, the head of the power plant, was happy. So therefore, I was, I was happy with it. Um, another match I really liked was the Glacier. I had probably more offense in that match than any other. As a matter of fact, I might have had 55% of it. Because again, it was cool coming out with his, all his lights and laser show. And that was also a really good match. Yeah, that, that, that's great. Now, a lot of people will remember uh, Glacier there from WCW. I saw him this year at the, uh, the NWA Fan Fest. Now, when you were there, who was on top at WCW? And just kind of like recap what years it was when you were there on TV. Well, I was going to say I started in uh, August of 96, but my first Orlando trip, my first TV taping, was October of uh, 97. At that time, the NWO was really huge. Um, Hogan was huge. Um, I remember going down to the Ice Palace for a nitro, and I you know, kind of sat the bitch for that. But I remember being backstage at every bitch office talking, and Flair was next to him, Hulk Hogan was next to him. It was a, it was a pretty cool, cool feeling after growing up, being a kid watching these guys, and now I'm sitting in the locker room with them. Oh, oh yeah. Now, uh, this was during, you know, the Monday Night War started during this time frame. What, how long did you stay in WCW? Did you stay to the very end when they were bought out? About one year beforehand, uh, the power plant was switching locations. Paul Orndorff came in and took it over. And that's when our ratings really started going down. And most of us did not know our ratings were going down at that time. But, uh, so you so know, it was on top for, for, for several, several weeks. You were there during the height? Right. I think they let me go May of 1999. So I was there almost three years. Yeah, and you, you were there during the entire time that they were beating WWE in the ratings. Yes, I was. 
Yeah, that, that was huge. That's, that, must have been a, that must have been a great feeling. Yes, it, it, it was. It was, um, it, it was pretty good. It was, uh, it was different. Um, it was an exciting time. It was a fun time. We had a lot of fun. Um, you know, I wish I could, it could last and last, but, uh, you know, Ken, I remember talking to Dustin Rhodes at an indie show a few years ago, and, uh, he said, yeah, the 90s, those late 90s were great, but, uh, you know, they're gone now, and we're not going to be able to do anything to bring them back. Yeah, that, that was really the height, when you look at the, the height of the business of professional wrestling was really those years. So you were right, you were right there riding on that, that wave, man. That, that was a great, that was a great time to be, to be in the business. And when you left WCW, did you continue to work some of the indie shows? I did. As a matter of fact, uh, for about five years thereafter, I worked the indie shows pretty hard. Right now, I consider myself semi retired. I'll still do something if it's available and I'm not going to really lose money. For it, but the last really major independent thing I did in my mind was uh, September 14th, uh, 2006. It was at a masquerade in Atlanta, Georgia. It was actually a benefit for uh, Sean. He was one of the guys from the power plant, and uh, he developed lung cancer. It was a benefit for him. Uh, T Rex was there, Ron Reese. Uh, I'm trying to Sarge was there and he helped set it up. Lita was there with her band. I think they're called the Lucha Goros or something like that. We'd wrestle a few matches and they would play a few songs. And, uh, yeah, Brad Armstrong was there, Chris Canyon. It was kind of a reunion of sorts. And that was, that was a good time. Man, isn't it sad too when you think about, you just mentioned the last two names you mentioned, Brad Armstrong and Chris Canyon, both of them are no longer with us. Yeah, matter of fact, the last match I attended was, I think, in either Cartersville or Gainesville, Georgia. I lived there with, uh, with, um, oh, I'm trying to remember, um, Bobby Delcom, um, Chris Adams, and Scott Kletsky. And two of us are gone, and you know, two of us are still here. Yeah, that, it, it's awful when you, when you look at, you look at the numbers of, of pro wrestlers that have, have passed away so young it, it's unbelievable i mean i recently saw the uh, documentary on world-class championship wrestling and that's that's very sad you know you mentioned you mentioned chris adams we're gonna we're gonna actually have lady blossom uh jeannie clark we're gonna be recording with her tomorrow night uh talking about her book where she, she talks about her time with stone cold steve austin and with, with the gentleman chris adams where she was one of the ballets you know during that time but it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. So let's turn it over to more something more positive. You know, your life now in law enforcement, uh, you've helped give me some, some great contacts. Of course, yourself is a great contact. And also the sheriff here. Uh, uh, we are not to, to get Dan involved by doing some of our, our DT programs. Yeah, that, that's what all the guys here need is, you know, all the training they can get. Things uh, out there seem to kind of be getting worse rather than better now. And, um, you know, I, I still love the training. It's a great, uh, you know, stress relief plus keeping me in good shape. I'll, I'll still hit the gym, uh, you know, three to five times a week. And, you know, hopefully we can get Dan or maybe some other guys like that to come down and, and work with everybody and help them out. Yeah, Dan has an excellent program. I, I sent it to, to Sheriff Lott, um, and uh, I've been in communication with them, and I want to thank you, you know, for setting us up. And hopefully we're going to get Dan uh, booked for one here uh, in the next month or so. Uh, we've had a lot of success with Wilmington, North Carolina, and up in Maryland, and, and he's had a lot of success out in Michigan with it as well with the various departments and I want to close with one thing. You had a really cool name and a really cool idea for a book. Uh, and I want you to, I want you to close with that because it's really cool. You were telling me about it at the gym. Yeah, I thought uh, about writing the book before. I thought about the title of View from the Bottom Up. Because, as you know, that was my finishing maneuver in every match I did with WCW. I was on my back. But from 
from my perspective, being at the power plant most of the week, being at all the shows and nitros, and, uh, and uh, you know, the Orlando trips, I mean, just sitting back out of quiet, just watching and observing, and uh, I got to see a lot, a lot. It, it's some interesting stuff. Yeah, it, it sounds like, what a wild ride. What an awesome time, too, for, for you to be in the business I mean it, it'll probably the business of professional wrestling will probably never be back to what it was during that time during the Monday Night Wars and you were with the company that was on top during a lot of that time period so I want to thank you for coming on the show everybody Brady Nimmons and uh, real quick I want to give you the floor if there's anything you want to promote your social media how do people get in contact with you I don't really. I'm on uh, Facebook, Michael Brady Nimmons. And uh, like I say, I, I'm, I'm still on both of the bank doing shows, but I probably don't do maybe more than one or two years. Something comes available. If I'm available, I'll do it. Sounds good. Well, thank you for being on the King's Court. I hope you have a, have a great night, and I will see you soon at the gym, man. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. Bye bye.
one of my best friends, the legendary Billy Wicks, who just passed on. And all of the profits of this shirt are going to Billy Wicks' family. That's what kind of a brand this is. They are not just an advertiser on the King's Court. They are not just an advertiser on the Arena Sports Network. They have become family. And let me tell you something else about American Grappler. Their shirts are of the finest quality. I've been training in these shirts and wearing them proudly for years. Support American Wrestling Heritage. Go to AmericanGrappler.us today. You'll be happy you did.